guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Dory and this channel is all about hiking gear, hiking tips and tricks and everything you need to know about hiking. In today's video, I'll be talking to you about the accommodation on the Bibbulmun Trek. So if you're planning to hike the Bibbulmun Trek in the near future, if you're planning an overnight hike or even a section of it, and then definitely this video is for you. All right, let's get started. This is the second time I'm actually um, recording this video because the first time I actually ran out of storage. So when I was done filming, I look at my phone and it's like, oh, I forgot to press the recording button. But um, yeah, I actually ran out of space. So I had to go back home, like delete a lot of footage from my phone and um, yeah, start all over. So here we are a week later, actually, and uh, we're going to try this again. Woo! If you're watching this video right now, you're probably planning to hike the Bibbulmun Trek in the near future. And if you are, this video will talk about everything you need to know about accommodation on the trek. If you haven't already, guys, I've got some other videos about planning the Bibbulmun Trek. And I will probably uh, put them around here somewhere in the video. Uh, definitely check them out because it will give you an overview about everything you need to know about the Bibbulmun Trek hiking and planning your Bibbulman track in different videos. All right, so the first thing you will probably ask is like what accommodation is available on the Bibbulman track. And I can tell you that there's about 49 campsites and huts all along the Bibbulman track from Perth to Albany. In the northern section of the track, they're about 10 kilometers apart from each other. And in the southern section of the track, you probably have to hike between 15 and 25 kilometers, okay, to, do, to get to the next hut. All these huts are actually inspired by the Appalachian Trail and um, they're all built by volunteers or sponsors. So I think that's pretty cool, guys. And um, what I'm going to show you next is what to expect when you get to the hut. So all the huts are pretty much three-sided shelters built in wood, although there is a few um, huts that are built in stone. There is one hut that is fully enclosed, which is Mount Wells, and it used to be an old fire watch station or tower. So, but pretty much all the other huts are three-sided shelters, okay? Every hut sleeps between eight to 16 people, but you also have a few tent sites that you can use to set up your tents. So depending on what you prefer, you might want to bring your tent and sleep in a tent every night, or you might sleep on the platforms that are provided inside the hut, but then it's more likely that you have to share with other people. Aside from the platforms and the tent sites, you can also find one sit-down bush toilet, whether or not it has toilet paper, that depends on the site. Two, at least two picnic tables, of which one is under cover. And of course, there's one or two rainwater tanks on site, so you can fill up your water when you get there. Like I mentioned before, toilet paper is not guaranteed, so always bring your own toilet paper. Um, and definitely, definitely, guys, I need to emphasize this because you cannot use wet wipes. You cannot put wet wipes in the toilet. It kind of messes up the decomposing process. Um, so please don't do that. Another thing you will always find in the hut and very importantly is the logbook. So there will be like a box, a plastic box or a wooden box um, at the hut where you will find a logbook, the red book and a few other um, bits and pieces um, for you to read. Um, so definitely, I mentioned this in a different video already, but definitely always sign the logbook, guys, because if you do go missing, they know where to start looking, um, because that will be the last time you sign the logbook, so they know that you know you didn't make it to the next hut, for example. And also, the red book is there to leave notes for other hikers, or even if you want to share a story or a poem or a drawing, you know, it's there for your entertainment. Um, I always read the Red Book because it's really interesting to read other people's thoughts. And um, yeah, it's, it's kind of nice because you feel like, you know, there so many other people have been there before you and they all experience something different. And also sometimes there's notes in there about, you know, specific wildlife that you can encounter near the hut. So it's always interesting to read those things. Okay, so that's what you can expect to find uh, when you get to the hut. Now, what do you need to know before you get there? So first of all, there is no booking system. Um, so pre-booking is not available and um, it's, a first, it's a first come first serve basis. But on the flip side, the huts are free to use for all the hikers. If you're planning to hike in a group of eight or more people, you do have to register on the website, bilbomontrack.org.au. And if you do 
travel in a group of eight plus, you cannot occupy the hut before 6 p.m. That's kind of like the rules, okay? All right, so because there is no booking system, it might be that you get to a hut and it's fully booked. So I would always recommend to bring a tent with you guys. It doesn't matter um, whether, you're not, whether or not you're going to use it, but it is also an emergency shelter, just in case if you don't make it to the next hut or something happens along the way. At least you have some shelter to keep you warm. So yeah, I think it's important, but I have not really come across a hut that was fully booked. Um, if you do get to a hut and it's late and you know you, you don't have a tent or whatever, well, people don't have to kind of move into their tents if if they don't want to. But you know, it's kind of like it's kind of like hikers help other hikers, so they will make space for you normally. It's not like they're gonna let you die out in the cold. <laughs> yeah, but definitely always take a tent with you, uh, especially if you're going into the busy season. So there is kind of like a code of conduct, which you can find on the website. I will put a link to it below, but it gives you a few simple rules to abide by because, you know, it's, it's for the enjoyment of everybody, okay? So simple rules such as keep your fire small, only cook with a fuel stove, guys. So don't use like the campfire to cook on. I mean, uh, some huts have um, these cooking plates, but yeah, it's, it's always recommended to cook with a fuel stove. Um, also leave no trace, pack it in, pack it out. If you pack it, you know, guys, just don't leave it at the huts because the volunteers will have to uh, remove it and they don't always come uh, very often. And believe it or not, that also includes empty gas canisters, you know, just if you pack it in, pack it out. So there's a few other simple rules and you can find them all on the website. Um, it's just to make it enjoyable for everybody. Then another important thing to mention is what do you do with water? So at every hut there is uh, one or two rainwater tanks that you can use. However, this is Western Australia guys, so it can be really dry around here and water is not guaranteed. However, I do know that they come and fill up the water tanks when they are empty. And also, um, guys, if, if there is an empty water tank, it usually will be written in the red book or there will be an announcement on the website, uh, which means that you can definitely prepare yourself when it comes to water. Um, along the track, you might not really find any streams, depending on the time of year you're going. Um, so most of the times you will be reliant on the water uh, near the huts. All right, so um, is the water safe to drink? Well, mm, mm, mm. that's a debatable question because the water comes, um, it's obviously rainwater and it comes from the roof of the hut. I would recommend to always treat it. I have heard from people that have been sick from the water on the Bimoon Trek. Um, you never know what's in it, even though it's just rainwater. There might be something in the gutters that um, actually contaminates the rainwater. You never know. So I would highly recommend to always filter the water because it wouldn't be pleasant if you get sick on the track. <laughs> All right, when we talk about water, we also have to talk about fire. And along the Bibbulmun track, at most campsites, there is a fire pit that you can use to make small fires. But again, the rules are please keep, the, keep your fire small and uh, never leave without extinguishing the fire. Obviously fires are banned during the summer months, which is usually between November and April. And there are um, huts and campsites where um, there is a total fire ban, pretty much anywhere south of Mount Chance. And also the Yurdemung and Yurdemung and Blackwood huts, okay? And then anywhere south of Mount Chance, uh, all fires are prohibited. So you will not see a fire pit um, near those huts. And if you don't see a fire pit, guys, don't try to make a fire because the fire pits are there to, to guide you to make a fire in the fire pit. Okay, does that make sense? I hope so. So that's it about fire. Always keep them small. It is very dry here in Western Australia. So we don't want you to start a fire. Also, if you, also guys, you don't want to get caught in a bushfire. <clears throat> so definitely keep that in mind. All right, so there's two other things I want to mention uh, to you guys, and that's town accommodation and then reception on the track. But before we go further, I want to just mention something really interesting. And I thought it was like the fun fact of the day is that th there is one hut which is wheelchair accessible. Um, so if you know anyone with mobility issues, you can take them to the Brook Brookton hut, which is about two and a half kilometers from the Brookton highway and it's accessible uh, via a trek. So it's pretty much accessible to everybody, even the toilets there or uh, wheelchair friendly. 
Okay. So I thought it was really interesting. I think that's an amazing thing to know. Um, so yeah, there we go. Fun fact of the day. So as I mentioned in a previous video, uh, the Bibelman track consists of different sections and the sections are pretty much based on the town that you go through. If you get into town, there is a list of accommodation options available on the Bibelman track website. Uh, there is something called walker friendly businesses and they really welcome hikers. So, you know, you don't have to feel embarrassed if you're <laughs> coming in with muddy boots or whatever, you know, so they, they do tailor for um, hikers. An example of that is the Dwelling Up Caravan Park because uh, they have hikers huts and um, although they're not very fancy but it's, um, it's a good way to meet other hikers that are you know doing the same thing as you um, and it gives you that little extra comfort when you get into town. You can choose to camp as well but um, I know most people want a bed to sleep in after a long section especially from uh, Kalamanda to Dwelling Up um, so yeah, there's, there's something for every budget and what I would recommend to doing is when you get to town you go to the visitor center where you can sign the logbook and then if you haven't got anything booked yet just ask the friendly staff there and I'm sure they will help you find some accommodation. Okay. If you get to town later than the opening hours of the visitor center then always check out the website guys and um, but in the busy season definitely make sure that you know you know a few options um, and always have a backup plan okay so I don't usually book accommodation until I get to town but there have been some people who have um, who have not been able to book accommodation as soon as they got to town so they were obliged to camp somewhere but you know what it's not a big deal um, I'd rather take my time and just you know decide on what I want when I get there if I want to take an extra day on the track, then I can actually do that. Okay, so I'm more like a last minute girl. <laughs> so I don't like to plan everything in detail in advance because it's more enjoyable if you have a flexible um, schedule. Although when you go into the busy season, just, just write down a few options. And then if one is full, then the other one. And um, you know, maybe some Airbnbs or some trail angels might be able to help you as well if you do get stuck. So always check out the Facebook page as well if you do get stuck. Okay, so the last thing I want to mention is uh, reception on the track. So not all huts have reception, although you can check um, your provider's network coverage. So if you are Telstra or Optus, just check the website. I will put a link in the description below. Um, you can check the website on where they are covered and where not. And you can also check out if it's 4G, 3G or whatever. Um, so then you know where to expect reception. If there is a hut without reception, sometimes you can find in the red book a few little notes on where to find reception um, nearby. And that's always good to know. So always be prepared that you might not have reception at the end of the day, okay? So yeah, there's so much to talk about when it comes to the Bibelman Trek or hiking in general. Um, and I could make this video like an hour long, but I'm not gonna do that. So if you have any more questions, put them in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them for now. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.